Well, good morning, everyone. Yeah, it's a it's a blessing to uh, to see uh, the generous donations that have been given so far. Um, and John, you scared me a little bit yesterday because when I read that message in the morning, I thought, "Oh, I got to go shopping yet," because uh, we had wanted to donate some stuff, and um, and I did. And so sometimes we need a little bit of urgent reminder, right? To uh, as the saying goes, that um, the work usually fills up the time that you allot for it. And so if we have one day, then it takes one day. Um, but not only the, the, the generous donations uh, of all this food, uh, we as elders were here yesterday morning uh, and had a meeting for a number of hours. And, uh, and there were other people working here. Uh, the, the cleaning staff was here. Uh, there were uh, people outside putting on siding and doing some of the finishing work there. And, and that was just a blessing uh, to see all that. So many people uh, giving of their time and energy and contributing to the, the growth of Beacon Bible Chapel. And so uh, thank you for all that you do and for your uh, generosity and contributions. Um, <clears throat> so why do we do all of the things that we do? Is there a reason? Is there a is there a reward or maybe a prize that you are looking forward to at the end of all of your doing? You know, we, uh, most of you, I'm sure, have heard the saying, keep your eyes on the prize. You're familiar with that, uh, a lot of you? And generally, when somebody says, keep your eyes on the prize, um, what they're saying is they're encouraging whoever they're talking to to stay focused and not get distracted in the pursuit of something maybe a, a reward, a prize, or a promotion. And so this morning, I would, uh, that's what I would like to title um, the message this morning, is Eyes on the Prize. And that is something that I think I need to be reminded of uh, on a regular basis, uh, especially as a Christian. There are so many things that compete for our attention today that um, I need to be reminded regularly to keep my eyes on the prize. Um, especially in these days. You know, there are so many things that compete for my attention. Um, I work from home, and uh, when I'm not busy doing actual work, um, I, you know, YouTube gets a lot of my time, and uh, sometimes too much. Uh, I mean, there's, there's other things that I could be doing, but uh, that, that's just an honest admission. Th that's one area where I spend some time that is not bad, but it's not productive. And I think we might all have areas in our lives where we give time. It's not necessarily bad or a, a, a sin, but it's just unproductive time. And, uh, and the more we are distracted, the easier it is for us to just take our focus off of the prize, to, keep our, to, to take our eyes off of the prize. And so the same thing can be said uh, to the Christian. Keep your eyes on the prize. And so what is that prize for the Christian? I think Paul sums it up best when he says in 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. Um, there's a number of scriptures that we'll be looking at this morning. So if you have your Bibles, um, I'll give you a chance to, to turn there. Uh, I'll try to give you a chance. Um, it might not always happen. But, uh, and for those of you that are taking notes, maybe you can jot down the references. So 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 7 and 8. So as I said, Paul, I think, sums up very well uh, what the prize is for the Christian. And he says, uh, 4, 7, and 8, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So before we go to verse 8, uh, he tells us a little bit about himself and uh, about the competition that he has been in. He says, I have fought the good fight. Past tense, he has, he has finished, he has fought. And then secondly, he says, I have finished the race and I have kept the faith. So he, his race is finished. But then in verse 8, he says, finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. I love that. The finally, 
there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. That is, that is our prize. We long for that day when the, when the, the righteous judge, God himself, uh, will give us that crown if we have been faithful. The prize is the full realization of what is promised to those who are in Christ. Those who are in Christ have this promise that they will receive this crown of righteousness. The crown of righteousness, the salvation of our souls. In other words, to be in the presence of God forever. Some of you, I'm sure you long for that. Maybe all of you. Especially in times of difficulty and, and just in all of the uncertainty that we've been dealing with. Uh, I think I have longed for that time more than any other time. Matthew 25 verse 21, uh, I think, puts it very well. When and Jesus himself says, Matthew 25, 21, His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. That is the prize. The prize that we are uh, fighting for, the prize that we are running for, is to hear these words from our Lord, well done, good, good and faithful servant, and then these beautiful words, enter into the joy of the Lord, when we will be able to rest. There is a rest that is waiting uh, for us, that is a rest that is up ahead, as Hebrews talks about. Is that where our eyes are focused? Is that the prize that is before us, that we are running for, to hear those words from our Lord? So let me ask you, are your eyes on the prize, or are you distracted? You know, for those of you that love sports, and I have a couple of sports um, illustrations this morning uh, that I think fit very well, but for those of you that like sports, uh, I think you realize the importance of staying focused. I really enjoy golf in the summer, and I'm not good at golf, but one thing I have learned, that if I want to be able to hit that little white ball and to hit it okay, straight, the, the, the simplest thing for me is to keep my eye on that ball. If in my through swing, I somehow close my eyes or just move my head slightly, the ball either just kind of rolls a few feet or it might go in a completely opposite direction. But in all, any time I've ever hit the ball well, I've had to tell myself, keep your eye on the ball. Whatever you do, doesn't matter how terrible your swing, but keep your eye on the ball. And, and wouldn't you know it, all of a sudden, you know, you hear that beautiful ping, and, and there it goes, nice and straight. Keep your eye on the ball. When you're driving and you see something beside the road that catches your eye and you look, how many of you have often had to swerve back because your hand naturally tends to go that direction? And isn't that the same thing that happens in life as well? I mean, when we're driving, we have a destination. The road is before us that we need to keep our eye on. And in the life that we walk as, as believers, we have a destination. The Bible refers to two ways, the broad way and the narrow way. And we are on the narrow way. And so if it is in Scripture defined as the narrow way, how much, how much more important then to keep our eyes on that? On a broad way, that's... Eh, not, not much of a problem, but in a narrow way, the importance of keeping our eyes focused. So again, are our are, are eyes on the prize, or are we being distracted? So a few points to consider this morning. First, a warning about distraction. There is, um, most of you will be familiar with Reader's Digest, the book, uh, years ago, there was a story in the Reader's Digest about golf legend Arnold Palmer, who recalls a lesson about overconfidence and distraction. It was, it was the final hole of the 1961 Masters Tournament, and I had one stroke lead and had just hit a very satisfying tee shot. I felt, it I, felt I was in pretty good shape. As I approached my ball, I saw an old friend standing at the edge of the gallery. He motioned me over, stuck out his hand, and said, Congratulations. I took his hand and shook it, but as soon as I did that, 
I knew I had lost my focus. On my next two shots, I hit the ball into the sand trap, then put it over the edge of the green. I missed the putt and lost the Masters. You don't forget a mistake like that. You just learn from it and become determined that you will never do it again. And I haven't in the 30 years since. Sometimes it's just something very minor that uh, takes our attention off. Basketball is my favorite sport. And uh, I, I grew up playing 21, which I'm sure a lot of you did. And I remember uh, years ago playing with a friend, uh, Pete Weeb. A lot of you know Pete Weeb. When we play, played 21, one thing that he had often said, that if he's in a rhythm of shooting and he's getting baskets in, if he gets the ball passed to him and he has to step in a, just off the place where he was standing, he misses the next shot. And you know, then at that point, you have an advantage. Because if you get the rebound, you just pass it a little bit over to the one side, he steps, and there it is. So what is your weakness that somebody can, else can exploit to, to distract you from what is really important? Do you have a weakness? And if you do have a weakness, are there people who are exploiting it? I tell you for sure that there are. Maybe not in your immediate circle of friends, but social media knows how to exploit your, your attention deficit disorders. It's, it's uh, the leaders or the, the head folks of social, social media networks have themselves said that they study how to capture people's attention so that they, the people will, you know, Facebook, and you're sitting there endlessly scrolling and scrolling for the next exciting story. A lot of studying goes in to how to keep your attention on those things. Who is trying to get your attention and motioning you over to the sidelines? When we think about the prize that is before us, which is to hear our Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. As a Christian, if that's where we are going, we need to be aware of those who are on the sidelines calling for our attention. We need to be alert. And I'm not sure if in these times where you've been home more during the, this COVID time, whether you have realized some areas that are maybe areas of, of weakness where you are easily drawn away or easily distracted. It seems like it is so bad that many people are busy enough managing the distractions that they have lost sight of the race and forgotten the prize. I'd like to say that again. It seems like that managing distractions, in managing distractions, people have become so busy that they have lost sight of the race and forgotten the prize. Maybe it's not who, but what. And we need to be careful, not, with, not just with who, but with what. There are many reasons to stay focused and keep our eyes on the prize. Consider uh, with me for a moment Hebrews chapter 12, 1 and 2. So Hebrews chapter 12, 1 and 2. It says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us, dr and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So first of all, we are told in verse 1 that we have many witnesses around us, those who have gone before and shown the example. And who is he referring to? Go back to chapter 11. Chapter 11 of Hebrews is sometimes referred to as the Hall of Faith. We read about all of these individuals from the Old Testament who, um, who practiced faith, who God used in a mighty way to overcome difficult things. And so it talks about Abraham, and it talks about Sarah, and many other individuals from the Bible, great examples of those who kept the faith, so to say. And so we are surrounded by these examples around us as if they are rooting for us to run well 
and free from anything that could hinder. And that's kind of what examples do. When, when you see somebody that has won a victory or has done something very well, just seeing it and, and noticing that they have done it well is almost like an encouragement to us to do it well also. So we have this cloud of witnesses around us rooting for us to run well and to run without anything hindering us. It tells us to lay aside every weight. So that could just be things that aren't sin, but things that distract from the best. Things that distract from the prize. And you can fill in the blank for yourself, whatever that may be. And for each one of us, it may be something different. What is a weight that, is, that could easily hinder your, your race? that could hinder um, you from being able to focus on the prize? What are these weaknesses that I mentioned before? But then it also says to get rid of the sin which so easily ensnares us. I mean, just think about that, that descriptive word, ensnares. Who of us likes to be trapped? No one. For those of you that like escape rooms, I mean, the whole idea is to get out of the escape room. You don't want to be trapped in there for forever. And it's fun to get out, out of those traps. But it is not fun to get out of a sin trap. It is difficult and it is grievous. And so we have this encouragement in verse 1 to lay aside every weight that hinders and the sin which so e easily ensnares us. And then lastly, and let us run with endurance. That's important to note that word there, endurance, because to run requires endurance. The, the, the victor, the one that receives the prize, doesn't get the prize just because they participated. I mean, nowadays, everybody gets a ribbon for, for participation. But the winner, we read here, they're the ones that get the prize. They're the ones that practice discipline. They discipline their bodies in order to be conditioned, in order to run that race so that they will win. You don't sit on the couch um, munching on potato chips in preparation for a race. Not if you're dedicated. Even greater than that, in verse 2, we are further encouraged when he says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that is set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So first of all, we have the witnesses of old that are, uh, so to say, surrounding us and rooting us on. But then we have the ultimate example, which is Jesus himself. And we are instructed to look to Jesus. Just like when we look to uh, the finish line in a race or maybe some other um, activity that you do where it's important to stay focused. Have you ever traced something on paper? You need to stay focused and, and keep your eye on that. And in our faith, we need to look to Jesus who is first of all the author and finisher of our faith. As our prime example, Jesus is the author and the finisher. And then it says, who, for the joy that was set before him, he was looking for a prize. He was looking for a reward. It was something that he was looking forward to. And because he was looking forward to it, he said, or we read that he endured the cross and shame in order to receive it. So we have these beautiful verses in Hebrews 12 encouraging us to keep our eyes on the prize. And what are we enduring or what do we need to endure in order for that to be consistent? For us to be able to consistently keep our eye on the prize. The message uh, translates Hebrews 12, or paraphrases Hebrews 12, verse 2 this way. 
It says, keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God, he could put up with anything along the way, cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. I, li I like that thought. Jesus finished this race, and then, he, and then he says, study how he did it. That's one way we learn, is to study those who have done something well. How do they do it? Well, let's do it. How many of you ever are in the middle of a project, and you don't quite know how to do it, and you go researching? YouTube is great for that. If you don't know how to do something, YouTube it. Th that's how we say it now. You just YouTube it. Jesus is our, do you want to know how to live the Christian life? Jesus it. Study how he did it. Eyes on the prize. So keeping our eyes on Jesus. Another great example of this we find in Matthew chapter 14. Um, and I think all of you would be familiar with the story, Matthew chapter 14, verses 18 through 31. You know the story of uh, where Jesus sends the disciples, he, he sends, puts them in a boat, and he sends them across the water, and then in the night, uh, Jesus is all of a sudden walking on the water towards them. And so when we pick that up in, in verse 28, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, Command me to come to you on the water. So first of all, that's interesting. That he's, he didn't just assume that he could, but he recognized who Christ was. And he says, command me to come to you on the water. In verse 29, so he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Simple, right? I mean, it might not sound simple, but... That's what happened. But then consider verse 30. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. So I don't know how long he was on the water. The Bible doesn't say. But if Jesus, if Peter was walking on the water towards Jesus, maybe it was a few steps, maybe it was a little bit longer, we don't know. But we do know that Jesus gave him permission, so to say, to come to him on the water. Peter steps out and does it. And I would imagine, in, a, in, an, in an uncertain situation like that, you'd be looking at Jesus. Because he's the one that came, that, that allowed you to come out, and you're the one, that's who you're going to. But the moment he notices the wind, the circumstances around him, he begins to sink. I, I think that needs to sink into us as well. That when we take our eyes off of Jesus and we start to focus more and more on the circumstances around us, it will impact our walk with Christ. For the runner, it, it could be a pulled hamstring or maybe a stone in the shoe. Little things that hinder, that cause distraction and unable to focus on that race. What is it for us? What is, what is the wind that is blowing around us that is asking for our attention? Or maybe not asking for it, we are tempted to look aside because of temptation, because of, well, whatever. Peter was distracted by the wind. And so what is stirring around us that makes it hard for us to keep the eyes on the prize. Well, one of the things that's stirring around us for sure is, is this whole deal with COVID and, and the distractions and the limitations and, and, and just all of it. It is a boisterous wind blowing around us and many, I believe, are distracted and beginning to sink because that is getting more of their attention than the prize than the race. <clears throat> Distractions abound. Social media, TV, phone calls, emails, websites, books, movies, 
stuff around the house, work, even church. You know, we can get too busy doing even in church. Busyness does not equal godliness. So those are some warnings about distractions. Secondly, um, how do we overcome these distractions? There is hope, and you may need to take some deliberate action to deal with the problem and press on like Paul did. He is a good example for us in overcoming. I would like to draw your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Paul says here, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? But one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. So I think we have a few things there that we can look at that could be instrumental in overcoming distraction. So first of all, he says that, you know, all who are running are running in a race and they're running to win a prize. And so he says, run in such a way that you can win. So all of us here this morning should run this, this Christian race as if we want to win it. But then he says in verse 25, and everyone who competes uh, for the prize is temperate. Temperate means uh, moderation or to, be self, uh, to practice self-restraint. If you've ever, uh, I know Sherry has and, and maybe some of you have, um, you know, done like a, a five-mile type of run or walk and you want to do it in a certain time. You know, you, you practice. You show self-restraint in, in maybe what you eat or what you don't eat. Whenever we are in a, in a competition where um, conditioning is needed, planning is also needed. When you work in anything that we do, if you want to be in good health, moderation, and self-restraint. Are there things, winds blowing, that, that you are giving attention to that are not wrong, so to say, but it is not in moderation, you have overdone it, or you're overdoing it. There is no self-restraint. It says now they, they're doing it for a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, he says in verse 26, uh, not with uncertainty. Paul had clarity in what he was doing. And I think it's important for us to have clarity in, in the race that we are in uh, so that we can run with certainty. Because he says he doesn't run with uncertainty. But then he also says he fights, not as one who beats the air, you know, like a, he's not practicing. Doctors practice medicine. We, uh, he says, he doesn't beat as one who beats the air, but he disciplines his body and brings it into subjection. His body is not the master of him. He rules his body. He says, okay, that's, that's enough cheesecake, or that's enough of this or of that. He says, that's enough sleep. I need to, you know, get up and get going. He is, he, disciplines himself and puts his body into subjection so that he is not going to be disqualified. None of us want to be disqualified. And so as I said before, in order to overcome, we may need to practice some deliberate um, actions or engage in some deliberate actions to deal with the problem. Philippians 3, 12 and 16. Paul again says, not that I have already attained or 
am already perfected. But I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself as having apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things that are ahead. I press forward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So he has, there are things that he is intentionally pursuing and he is um, putting some energy and some effort into it. He's not perfect. He says he hasn't, he hasn't come to that place yet, but he does a few things on purpose. He says, I press on that I may lay hold of the prize. That's pushing through. In verse 13, he says, I do not count myself as having apprehended, but one thing I do, he, he forgets the things that are behind. Last Sunday, we had a, a good reminder from Henry about forgiveness. And maybe there are things where, as he had mentioned, where you just can't forgive yourself about a failure or something. And, and it's that un inability to forgive yourself that is a distraction and that is preventing you from pressing on as Paul does. Or maybe it's the, the offense of somebody else who has done something that is enabling you or preventing you from pressing on. And it is serving as a distraction. Something or someone that is inviting you to the sidelines and, and wants to fellowship with you and shake your hand that is distracting you from your goal. He says, I press toward the goal for the prize and the upward call of God. So intentional about his faith. Paul was clear and what his purpose was and where he was going. And he was disciplined uh, to be able to fulfill that. And, and he moved forward with, with clarity and with certainty. There's a story, for those of you that love baseball, uh, we're, going, we're going years back. There's a story involving Yogi Barra, the well-known catcher of the New York Yankees, and Hank Aaron, who at that time was the main power hitter for the Milwaukee Braves. They used to be in Milwaukee. The teams were playing in the World Series, and as usual, Yogi was keeping up his ceaseless chatter, intended to pep up his teammates on the one hand and distract the Milwaukee batters on the other. As Aaron came to the plate, Yogi tried to distract him by saying, Henry, you're holding the bat wrong. You're supposed to hold it so that you can read the trademark. Aaron didn't say anything, but when the next pitch came, he hit it into the left field bleachers. After rounding the bases he tagged up at home plate, Aaron looked at Yogi and said, I didn't come up here to read. And I think us too, we need to have that kind of determination that we are not living this Christian life to be distracted with all kinds of nonsense around us. We are living this Christian life because we have an upward call towards God a prize that we are fighting for, a finish line that we need to cross. And if that is not our aim and what we are running for, then, then what's the point? The point is not to just be distracted and to entertain all the distractions that are around us. The point is to finish the race and to finish it well. So there is hope in being able to overcome but it may require some deliberate actions on your part for you to think some of these things through and say, I will. I think in the Sunday school classes for the children, they had these I will statements years back. And so what, what will I do to limit distractions so that I can keep my eyes on the prize? And then thirdly, I want to just briefly talk about that God provides a solution for the things that distract us, for the things that hinder us. And this is, I want to take you back to the Old Testament in the book of Numbers. And just as we look to Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith, just that picture of looking to Jesus, he is, so to say, at the end of the race, at the end of the line, waiting for us to, to finish. Because he says he finished the race. He overcame the world. He's done. And now we are on our way, and as if he is waiting. 
And so as we look to Jesus, there's, there's a story in the Old Testament where the nation of Israel had to look to a particular solution for a problem that they had. And I would like to just cover that briefly. Numbers 21, verses 4 to 9. Numbers 21, 4 to 9. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of, the, out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people, of, uh, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for, for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was. If a serpent had, been, had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. What an interesting solution to their problem. Um, the people of Israel so often got distracted from where they were going from the prize, and they were distracted with, well, as we see here, uh, they became discouraged and, and started grumbling and complaining against God and also against their leader, Moses. And, and to, why have you brought us out here to die? You know, we don't like this worthless bread. It was just, you know, whining and complaining. And you need to be sent home to mother. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, after the serpents came and the, their sin was exposed and they were the consequences of their sin came upon them, they admit that we have sinned. And then and Moses intercedes on their behalf and God provides the solution. So what is the venom that, that may be infecting you, infecting me, that is preventing us from living or running the race and, to, and, and preventing us from running it faithfully. God has provided the solution, and it is Jesus. Just like the people, after they were bitten, when they looked at this uh, bronze serpent, they didn't die. And isn't that interesting? I don't know, often when I have read that, I thought, oh, the, the bronze serpent was raised and the problem is solved. It's, it's done. But this week as I was reading it, I don't see any place where the fiery serpents were removed from the people. They were still in the same situation. But something had changed and that was a solution to the problem that they were in the midst of. Because it says, when they were bitten, if a person looks at the bronze serpent, then they will live. We are in the midst of, well, any you name the situation that you are in the midst of. All of us are in the midst of COVID, but you may have some things uh, that is more specific to you, a storm that's boisterous around you, um, something that is making you sick, so to say. And we look to Jesus. And it's interesting. I bring that story up because Jesus is the one we look to. Because he himself said it in John chapter 3. When Nicodemus uh, confronted Jesus, Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and you will not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who has come down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man will be lifted up, 
and that, and that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So just like the Israelites were in the midst of uh, a problem, a solution was provided. And their problem, as we can tell, they were distracted, complaining and grumbling about where they were. And Jesus himself was lifted up that for us to look at, that if we believe on him, we should not perish. So just in conclusion, as, as I bring it to a close, we had a warning about distractions. So consider the, the distractions that may be uh, around you. We have hope to overcome the distractions because of the word of God and the solution that has been provided in Christ. We have a prize that is available to all of us. It's not like we are all running, but only one of us is going to get it. If we all finish the race, the prize will be there when we hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. That beautiful phrase can be said to all of you and to me. One last illustration um, for us to, to not be confused or rather for us to, to be focused and to be alert <clears throat> and to not allow things um, to just sneak past us unawares. Oz Guinness, in a book that he wrote called The Devil's Gauntlet, shares a, um, a story and it goes like this. Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev used to tell of a time when there was a wave of petty theft in the Soviet Union. To curtail, to curtail this, the authorities put up guards around the factories. At one timber works in Leningrad, the guard knew the workers in the factory very well. The first evening, out came Petrovich, which had a wheelbarrow, and on the wheelbarrow a great bulky sack with a suspicious looking object inside. All right, Petrovich, said the guard. What have you got there? Oh, just sawdust and shavings, Petrovich replied. Come on, the guard said. I wasn't born yesterday. Tip it out. And out came nothing but sawdust and shavings. So he was allowed to put it all back in and, and go home. When the same thing happened every night for a week, the guard became frustrated. Finally, his curiosity overcame his frustration overcame his frustration. Petrovich, he said, I know you. Tell me what you're smuggling out of here, and I'll let you go. Wheelbarrows, my friend. Wheelbarrows. The guard was so focused on, this, on the sack, he lost sight of the wheelbarrow again and again. What, what are you focusing on? What is sneaking past you every morning or every day that is preventing you from seeing or that's preventing you from keeping your eye on the prize. Peter says it very well in, in 2 Peter 3, 11 and 13. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for the hastening and the coming of, of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's where we're going, to a new heaven and to a new earth where righteousness dwells. So may we be faithful um, in our daily walk, in keeping focused, um, in keeping our eye on the prize that we would not be distracted with the things. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give you thanks for, for your goodness and just for your, for your love toward us. Lord, we thank you that, that we are able to look ahead, to look to uh, the prize that awaits us, the crown of righteousness. 
the words from you, our Lord and Savior, uh, to be able to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. And Lord, I'm sure we are all in need of a place of joy in these times. And so, Father, I just pray that by your Spirit, you would lead us and guide us, enable us to uh, lay aside those things that hinder our, the race that we are in. And we could realize the things that are just easily distracting us or that are ensnaring us. And so, Father, I pray for courage and for strength to lay those things aside and to be able to run, as Paul did, with certainty and with clarity the race that is before us. We ask it for your name, for your glory. Amen.